Today will be my final review of the 1599 Geneva Bible. I've done two reviews on this in the past, but neither came out perfectly. So today I'm going to finish this finally and we're going to do a perfect review and that's going to be it. Okay, so we have the Patriots edition and we also have the 1560 edition of the Geneva Bible. This is when it actually came out and I'll just go ahead and tell you a difference between these two. The 1560 has the Apocrypha with it. The 1599 omits it. So if you will like a Geneva Bible with the Apocrypha, you're going to want the 1560 edition. And if you do not, 1599. Patriots edition. So we're going to get into this right now. So the book is kind of thin. It's hardcover. Not that thin but you know it's it's, it's kind of lightweight a little heavy though you do this enough yeah to get to you kind of quick so let's um open this baby up so this is the second edition by the way and it only has the old and new testaments and it says that it was copyrighted in 2010 2021 by Toli Lodgy Press. And this is the second edition once again. Oh, and by the way, if you want the same exact one that I have here in the video, you can type in this ISBN number in the internet and it should pull up the same exact book. Or you can go to a website like Amazon, any website that sells books, type in this ISBN number and it should pull up this book if they sell it. If they don't sell it, it's not going to pull it up. So, or you can just type in the title of the book, however you find it. I don't think it's going to be difficult to find, but here's the table of contents. I'm not going to get into everything, but just to, so you can see, we have the prayer of George Washington. Um, we have the preface, the history and impact of the Geneva Bible by Dr. Marshall Foster. The Old and New Testaments, glossary of Middle English terms originally used in the 1599 Geneva Bible, historical documents. We have the Mayflower Compact, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, amendments to the Constitu uh, Constitution, sorry, and some extra stuff. And I'm going to read the preface and all of that last because it's a lot to read. So I'll, I'll skip that. Matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and tell you about my opinion on the amount of space they gave you all around the edges of the book, what well, the pages, and on the inside of the pages and things like that to write in your extra notes and cross references and stuff like that. So really, the only decent amount of space they give you is on the top of the pages and in the inside where they put the cross references and things like that. So this is a study Bible. Let me go ahead and get that out the way. You do have notes at every page or at least a lot of the pages at the bottom. And they even give you some Hebrew definitions or Hebrew things like that. Maybe even Greek. I don't really know for the New Testament, but I assume if they gave you Hebrew, why not for the Greek? Um, they look like meanings, by the way. I didn't really read them before. But... You got your cross references up here and all of that empty space can be where you write in your own cross references because they don't give you that many. A lot of pages are blank like that. Like as you can see this one. <laughs> like this one is completely blank. Nothing. Nothing in there. So on the left side of the pages and on the inside of the pages you got hardly any space to write in your cross references notes or anything like that. That is a negative to me, but at least you got space at the tops of the pages and in the middle after the cross references and things like that. So at least you got some space. But I don't I don't prefer it to be like that, just being that's just my honest opinion. But we're in Judges 18 um verse 30. And it says, Then the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were the priests in the tribe of the Danites. 
and I'm sorry, until the until the day of the captivity of the land. The reason Manasseh is highlighted, if you look at this verse in other translations of the Bible, some of them say Manasseh and some of them say Moses. And when you look at the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, you'll see that the noon, um, the equivalent for noon is the end in English, is suspended above the line. It's a controversy about that. And it's said that when a Hebrew letter is suspended above the line, it's done so that they could, well, it's, it's when a letter was added to the text that wasn't supposed to be there. So without that noon in the text, the, the word will be um, Moses. So it's information out there to say that people were trying to hide the fact that Moses had an idolatrous grandson um, in this context right here. But they translated it as Manasseh, and I would prefer it said Moses. But anyway, so um, we got 1 Kings 15, 1 through 10. Here we go. And this one is, they gave you some beneficial information on this one, but here we go. We're just going to read 1 through 2 and 8 through 10. So it says, and in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Malcha, the daughter of Abishalom. Then we go to verse 8. And Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the 20 years of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. He reigned in Jerusalem one and forty years, and his mother's name was Malcha, the daughter of Abishalom. So, they left it as mother in this uh, in verse ten, but they put a one next to it. If you can see that one, now if we come down to the bottom and find fifteen ten, at least they gave you the understanding. It says that is his grandmother. As David is oftentimes called the father of them whose grandfather he was. Now, it is, well, it can be confusing if you were reading this and they didn't give you a note at the bottom saying that that's his grandmother. The, the 1611 uh, King James Version did something similar to that. Because I was reading this one day, and if you ever are reading this and you come across it and you're like, wait a minute now. So you mean Abijam and his son got the same mom? What? But some translations will say grandmother. Some just say mother. So depending on the translation, it could confuse you. But at least some translations leave you a note at the bottom or on the side somewhere letting you know that's his grandmother. The Hebrew word for mother and grandmother are the same. So, excuse me, um... Some people, well, some translators translated mother, some grandmother. But in this case, by the context and the bloodline, that was Asa's grandmother. But they left it as mother. I would have just translated it grandmother and ended the confusion. So, this one isn't the, um, the translators of the Geneva Bible's fault at the time in 1560 when they was doing that, when they put it together, because... At the time, in uh, Psalm 145, they discovered some manuscripts later on, and one of the Dead Sea Scrolls had, well, some of the manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls that they found had the restored verse to Psalm 145. So it isn't those translators' fault back then because the discoveries wasn't made yet, or at least the Dead Sea Scrolls wasn't discovered. And since they found it, they restored the missing verse of Psalm 145 back to the text. But this Bible, you know, when they translated it, they didn't have it, so they didn't restore it. So if you are getting this Bible or if you do want this Bible, just know that neither of these, the Geneva 1560 or 1599, have the missing verse in Psalm 145 restored back to the text. It's only 21 verses. Neither does the 1611 because they didn't have the discoveries either. A lot of Bibles don't have the missing verse restored back to the text from Psalm 145, but some of the modern versions like the NRSV, 
uh, the new Oxford Annotated Bible with the Apocrypha, the 5th edition. They did restore it back to the text. A lot of the NRSV Bibles did this, not just that one, but the one that I have right there. If you want that one specifically, they restored it back to the text. So that's something you won't get, but that's kind of normal because the discoveries were made much later. So hopefully a lot, a lot more Bibles, you know, restored back to the text. Um, so in Acts 12, 4, I'm happy to see that they translated it this way. It says, and when he had caught him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarterneans of soldiers to be kept intending after the Passover to bring him forth to the people. And I highlighted the Passover because if you look into the KJV, the 1611 or some modern editions or just other translations in general, just do a search. Go to Bible Hub Bible Gateway and compare a bunch of translations. Or if you got a if you got different translations in your home, just look at your Bible translations and see does it say the Passover in this verse or Easter? The key, the 1611 says Easter. The 1599 and the 1560 Geneva Bible says Passover. I don't know why some translations say Easter. I cannot, I cannot explain that. But it is good to see that it says Passover. <laughs> so um, that's a good thing about that one. Now we're getting to the back of the book. So we have a glossary in the back of the book. By the way, there are no maps. This Bible did not come with a bookmark sewed in or, you know, however they have it in there. I don't think they tape it in, but did I say tape? I mean glue. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> they might glue it in there. I don't know. I need to find that out. Anyway, like matter of fact, the 1560 comes with a bookmark. <laughs> But this $15.99 then. It's not looking good for you, $15.99. But anyway, uh, we got the glossary in the back. And um, we have word, meaning, and simple location. I mean, sample location. So we have example. Let me find one that I want to read. Admiration. Meaning, wonder. Location, Revelation 8.1. And it says notes. Some of them don't say notes. So I would assume that... The ones that don't say notes is flat out in the verse. And the ones that do say notes could be at the bottom while the notes is at. And they have a lot of those. And that's pretty good. I haven't seen too many glossaries like this. So that's pretty good. They go over a lot of words. So that's pretty good. And what else do we got back here? We got the Magna Carta, which... Seems to be like rules and stuff like that, but I haven't really read it. I just skimmed through it. And we have the Mayflower Compact. Now, this will give you some indication that the king, King James, who was responsible for having the 1611 King James Version put together, he was not one of the translators. Some people think he was. He wasn't. But he was, um, what, from my understanding, by the way, he was one of the people that helped put this together. But he was alive around this time, seems like, because this is in here. It says, by William Bradford, it says, in the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. Did I say that right? Um, King, defender of the faith, etc. And it goes into more, 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 blah, 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 blah. And then it goes over his name again, the same thing. So, you know, it appears that King James was on the scene around this time. They put that in his Bible. And we have the Declaration of Independence in here as well. I thought it would be good for me to get it because I never had a copy of that, nor have I ever read it. And we have the Constitution of the United States. I didn't pronounce that the best way, but... I think y'all understand what I said. <laughs> Rules of civility. I don't even care to read that. <laughs> I'm going to just read one of them. Just see what they're talking about. 49. It says, use no repro uh, reproachful language against any other, neither curse nor revile. Okay, that's, that's good stuff. Okay. Now, I ain't read everything, but you know, some good rules in here. All right, now. 
circular to the states. What else we got? Okay, that's it. In the, oh, wait, wait. Let's see. George Washington's prayer for the United States of America. All right. All right, yeah. Now, in the beginning, we got a lot to read. We got a lot to read. Whoo, I almost forgot about that. Mm. Preface time. Oh, boy. Here we go. So, I'm just going to read some of the highlighted parts. Not all of it. It's too much. All right, here we go. So, it says, our source copy, published by L.L. L. Brown, the 1599 Bible, Ozark, M.O., L.L. Brown Publishing, 7th Printing, 2003, with an introduction by James W. Bennett, and back matter containing the updated, I mean undated, Sternhold and Hopkins Psalms, the Apocrypha and Metrical Psalms included in that edition are omitted here, as well as the brief introductions to the Old Testament books, since they were not available for the New Testament books, we elected to omit them consistently. And they sure did. There is no Apocrypha in here. But it's in there. It's in that one, the 1560. Alright, so what else we got? So this one says proper names. We have also changed the spelling of the proper names in the Bible to that of the New King James Version. Since this can greatly help the contemporary reader and does not compromise the meaning of the original edition. If, however, the New King James Version, you, I don't care to read the rest of that, but that's there. We got also changes in meaning. For example, I'm just going to read the highlighted part. In Matthew 3.16, the source Geneva reads, that John saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning. Excuse me. Now notice that it says lightning. When you actually go to that verse, it says lighting without that N. And it's in brackets, but I'm, I'm going to keep going. So it says, um, Matthew 3.16, the source Geneva reads that John saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning on Jesus. Because the intended word is so clearly like ting, we made the change, but were yet concerned to place that word in brackets, indicating that it was a change from the source edition. I like that part. They was honest about that. I like, you know, people that inform us about things like that. Because if you're going to make a change, let me know. Give me some info about it. You know what I mean? So, I like that, you know. So, here we go. We got the history and impact of the Geneva Bible. And we're going to read some of this highlighted part. So, this version, matter of fact, I'll just start here. Nearly forgotten by the modern world, this version of the Holy Scriptures was researched, compiled, and translated into English by exiled reformers in Geneva, Switzerland, between 1557 and 1560. And then it says... Um, Oh, yeah, this is what I learned. It says, Jamestown is what is now Virginia. That, I didn't know that. Now, where we at? Okay, setting the stage right here. I'm going to start at the top. England of 1557 was a society beset by contradictions. I'm trying to get that clear. There we go. Oppression, even barbarity. More than 300 men had been burned at the stake by the Catholic tyrant Bloody Mary. Tudor. That's her last name, by the way. Um, now, I'm not going to read the rest of that. Here we go, right here. Rome's missionaries and monasteries had played their roles in civilizing the pagan tribes of Europe and establishing Christian authority. But abuse of power and perversion of truth. Sorry. I was going to say it wrong at first. Perversion of truth by prelates and kings were okay yeah uh were commonplace by the renaissance or renaissance something like that and we're going to come down to this part history of the geneva bible i'll start about yeah might as well read this part the geneva translations um revolutionary 
If I say that right, revolutionary, I left out the loop. Revolutionary impact can be better appreciated by the realization that the bio, I was trying to get closer in there, um, cause I'm reading this through the camera lens with a little camera screen on here. Okay. That the Bible has only been available to laymen for 400 years prior to printing of Luther's German Bible in 1534 and the Geneva Bible in English. Everyday believers, regardless of nationality, had never had a Bible of their own to read, study, to hide in their hearts. And then we come down to this part. I'm going to start where it says, Fulfilling his promise, Tyndale publishing, I mean, published the first ever mechanically uh, printed New Testament in the English language in 1526. And we're going to come down to this part where it says, But Tyndale was hunted, captured, and imprisoned in the Belgium town of Vivord on March 6, 1536. He was strangled and burned at the stake. His last words, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. His prayers were answered. Tyndale's monumental work made its way to some English pulpits. And one had been paid for by the same king who persecuted him, Henry VIII, who became a supporter of Protestant reformers. What a highlighted part is that in 1553, upon the death of Henry VIII's 16 year old Protestant son, Edward Mary Tudor, ascended to the throne, soon married the Catholic King of Spain and set about often with violent cruelty to stamp out the Reformation, I mean Reformation, determined to force the English people back to Roman Catholicism. She ordered the burning of all copies of the Bible in, in English. And let's see. She caused more than 300 reformers, pastors, and Bible translators to be burned at the stake, well earning her for all of history the so bright, I mean the so bright, Bloody Mary. And we come down here. It says the Geneva Bible, the first English translation from the original tongue since Tyndale's revised New Testament of 1534. The reformers sought to produce a Bible that was not based on the less authentic Latin Vulgate, promoted by Queen Mary. They Well, I'm not going to read that part. I'm going to come down here. It says, the result was the first Bible translation produced by a committee rather... Um, okay, here we go. Rather than by one individual. And then right here, it says the completed Geneva Bible was published in 1560 and dedicated to Queen Elizabeth, who had succeeded her half-sister, Bloody Mary, to the throne. And at least for political reasons, supported a definitive break with the Church of Rome. This unique 2000, uh, 2006 edition of the 1599 version of the Geneva Bible uses Thompson's revised New Testament, a later a revision of Whittingham's New Testament of 1557 and Genias, well, Genias's annotated notes on Revelation. Good to know. Also included were prayers to be used by English congregations every morning and evening. Yeah, that is in the, um, somewhere, in the, I think it's in the back of the Bible. Uh, somewhere back there. Um, what else we got? Okay, over here. Oh, I read that part. I'm going to read that again. Okay, over here we got the Geneva Bible lost its prominence only after the King James authorized version of 1611 was widely promoted by the King and Bishop Laud, later Archbishop of Canterbury and persecutor of Presbyterians who outlawed the printing of the Geneva Bible in the realm. Interesting. And we got, oh, I'm not going to read that part. Okay, so that is all I'm going to read from the preface. It is more, and that's the um, prayer of George Washington. That's probably the second one. So that was my review of the 1599 Geneva Bible, Patriots edition, if I said that properly. Patriots, Patri Patriots, there we go. Whew. Patriarchs and Patriots, I get them too mixed up, but 
on the back we also have it saying every offer and man, I'm sorry officer every officer and man should live and act as becomes a Christian soldier defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country President George Washington now that is basically it so now you all have a little bit of idea about the 1599 Geneva Bible now maybe one day I will do more of a comparison between the two but today was mainly just to talk about the 1599 Geneva Bible now I've been asked which is the best Geneva Bible in my opinion I will go with the 1560 and it depends on the type of person and what you want in your Bible because I only find this Bible valuable well the main reasons I got this was because I wanted to get the 1599 it was adjusted suggested to me and it was two to get it was either um, the Luther's Geneva Bible or this one and this one had the Constitution and the amendments and I never had that before nor have I ever read it so I wanted it because of that the Luther's Bible come with some additional other stuff and I didn't think it was better than getting this one but this Bible is just gonna sit over there with all these books and regularly be read I will not make it my main study Bible and the 1560 uh, is going to sit over there as well. But I will probably use it more because it has the Apocrypha in it. And any Bible that is going to be my main Bible has to have that for now. So it depends on what you all would like in your Bible. So right now I'm not going to go too far into which is the best. But to me, I will side with the 1560. They didn't omit the Apocrypha and some other information like the 1599 and also the 1560 does have maps in it so maybe I'll do a comparison but I will also like one day most high willing to get the Luther's Geneva Bible and then compare all three all at the same time so we'll know officially which is the best Geneva Bible I don't know how many more out there are there there are to get hmm there's only three that I know of, but I think that'll be good enough just to do those three. So that's my review. Peace be to the saints, and thank you for watching all of my Geneva Bible reviews so far. I apologize that I've had to do three, but I had to really get my professional camera out and do this video all in one take because my computer is down. I have to get another one. Until then, peace be to the saints, and... I hope you found this video helpful.